Uh, I'm Pastor Logan, obviously. I'm the pastoral intern here at the Neighborhood Church. So some of you are probably wondering, what does Logan do besides junior youth? Does the intern just make coffee all day? Or does he do grunt labor, uh, scrub toilets? Um, I, as Pastor Jasmine says, I, ba- I very rarely make coffee. I have yet to actually like scrub the floors in this um, province, but during Montreal, I did do lots of that. Uh, I have done lots of grunt labor. So the answer to your questions and everything and beyond is yes. I've probably done it, and I probably love doing it because working here and interning here has been fantastic. Uh, one time at uh, Ball and Barbecue, I was doing grunt labor, and Pastor Donna comes up to me, and she's like, Logan, you're doing such a great job. But she's like, I have a secret to tell you. She leans in, and she like whispers to me, and she's like, Logan, I just have to tell you that intern is just a, is just a word for church slave. Uh, we, we, we both got a really good kick out of that. <laughs> um, but all jokes aside, obviously, I work with our next-gen team under Pastor Yasmin and Ethan, so they've been fantastic in leading me, so shout-out to them. And Paige, my partner in crime, who kind of isn't down here right now because she's bidding, busy leading our kids, but her and I do junior youth together, and it's been fantastic. Uh, I also do a lot of the production stuff, so, you know, lights and sound and whatever else they kind of need me to do here on Saturday night, and I love it. But I also get to do our content, so I kind of, me and Joel kind of took on our YouTube videos and our podcast. So if you love this message, or if you hate it, please subscribe to uh, all of our podcast services and our YouTube channel. We could really use the support and everything like that. And if you just love to hear my lovely voice, serenade you to sleep, you can absolutely do it there too. So enough about my job. Uh, I'm from Brandon, Manitoba. I was born and raised there. Um... It's a, you know, Brandon's Brandon. I love it there. Shout out to all my Brandon friends who aren't here, but hopefully will listen to this later. <laughs> um, and so I grew up with two older brothers. So it was Logan, Taylor, then Cody. Um, and as you could, you know, assume, there was probably, you know, lots of fist fights, wrestling matches in the hallway. Uh, you know the scene from Home Alone where, they, where he, like, sleds down the stairs? Yeah, we probably did that a couple of times. So I I have to brag for a second. Um, My mom, who couldn't be here today but really wanted to, she's the best. Like, I know that all you other parents in here are fantastic and you're amazing and you do such great work, but, like, my mom's the best, okay? Like, she raised three boys by herself. Like, I still don't know how she managed to do it. Like, she comes, she probably came home and saw us doing, like, flying elbows off the couch or, like, differing things like that. So, like, I'm still surprised she did it, but... Yeah, that's kind of enough about me. So you're probably wondering, how does this born and raised Manitoba boy end up here in the big city of Saskatoon as, you know, it was to me back in little old Brandon? Um, Well, I go to Horizon, so shout out to all my friends from Horizon who came out. Thank you for supporting me. Um, I'm in my fourth year, so that means hopefully in April, Lord willing, I graduate. And as part of every program at Horizon where you do a degree, you take an internship of some kind. So we've come full circle, and now I'm here. Um, And so my professor for my internship is in the house, so if you guys could just really pretend that you like what you're hearing and everything like that, it would really boost my grade. (laughs) But (laughs) there we go. Thank you. Um, But kind of enough niceties and jokes. Um, uh, There's something really spiritual that is going on tonight, too. So... I think it was my second time coming here. I was sitting in the Little Horizon section over there, and I got a vision from God of me standing on this stage. Our our stage, and it looked like this stage back when we used to have the arches and everything like that, and I was like, well, that's kind of cool. You know, I'm going to be a pastor someday, so of course I'll preach on a stage. Uh, And then through another friend of mine, they were like, well, no, it's it's this stage. Like, you're going to preach here. And so... I kind of set a goal for myself, you know, one of those goals that are really not reachable, but you try. I'm like, you know what, in my four years, I'm going to try to preach at the neighborhood church, and God is good because I'm here, so I, I'm just so ecstatic and excited to be here. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, let's give God the glory right now. That's amazing. But that's, you know, enough about me and the boring introduction stuff. Let's get into the meat of what we're going to talk about. 
So obviously we're continuing our series in Making Space, um, and tonight we're going to kind of, I want to answer the question, how in the busyness of life, because we're all busy, how do we still make space for Jesus? Or why does it seem that there is not space for Jesus in Christmas? And we can see that it's super challenging during Christmas because we have so many extra things we have to do. We got kids plays and concerts and baking cookies and skating and hockey games and, and auctions and whatever else you want to add on there. I don't know, but we always seem so busy around Christmas. So to help illustrate that, we have a funny little video that we're going to show. And then, yeah, so we can show that video. Who relates to that video? Like, if you've ever seen a gift of mine wrapped, it does not look like that. It's probably wrapped in duct tape or something because I give up and I just don't really, yeah. But we see that Christmas is, is for some reason, this exceptionally busy time, right? His list was so long with things that, like, just took up all of his time and all of his space. And it really seems like something more important always comes along. It's always, something always gets bumped up in the queue of time before we can spend that time with Jesus. So is there any space for Jesus? Yes, yes, yes there is. <laughs> so sticking with our theme and Christmas and everything like that, um, we're going to read part of our Christmas story. It should be put up on the screen. If you want to turn into your Bibles, you can go to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Uh, I'm reading NIV, but you guys can read whatever version you want. <laughs> so this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. 
his mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So, he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he even considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the, tri- for the child within her was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save all his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet, which says, Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, And they will call him Emmanuel, which is God be with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. Now, when we talk about this verse and we kind of wondering, you're asking yourself, Pastor Logan, what does this verse have to do anything with making space? Well, we we have to look at this fancy word called context. Now, context is just some word I paid about $40,000 to really learn the meaning of. (laughs) But, all jokes aside, context is just the best way of looking at everything surrounding the text. So you look at the beginning, you look at the after, you look at the culture and the history, and it just helps you get a fuller understanding of what's being said. So the first thing to note, that obviously we're in Matthew, So Matthew is the author, and he's writing to a Jewish audience. He's not writing for us today in this room. He's writing to the Jews of the time. He's not writing to the Gentiles like Paul in some of his letters. He's writing to the Jews. So this means that culturally, the Jewish people were waiting for the son of David to come and be this mighty warrior type, to save and protect them. They had this messianic expectation, it's called. It's they're waiting and waiting and waiting for Jesus, for a Messiah to come and rescue them. Matthew kind of has the hard job in this, in this, you know, passage of bursting their bubble a little bit and saying, well, actually, the Messiah you think is coming isn't coming, so now you have this guy, Jesus. Matthew's primary focus in this passage is not to establish the bloodline of Jesus, We see that uh, in the previous verses, but that's not his goal. His main goal is to establish that Jesus is the Son of God, come to save the world. The Jews of this time, again, were very concerned with the law and the shame and honor culture of keeping the law. So this meant that the law told them the way for David. That's, That's what they had to do. So the Jews didn't have space for Jesus because they were waiting for somebody else and they weren't willing to change. So Matthew's now trying to to open their eyes to that. So now that we know that the law plays a huge role in this time of the Bible, when looking at the story, we have to have an understanding of the wedding ceremony and the law surrounding that. So the Jewish betrothal, which was sort of like a part of the wedding ceremony, was a solemn promise made before witnesses. So it wasn't just like Mary and Joseph decided they were going to be married. No, it was both families coming together with, like, witnessing this to say, like, if this doesn't happen, like, we're holding you accountable. It was a very, very important uh, step in the process. And the Jewish betrothal was the marriage itself. It embodied everything about it. And we have to also remember that the Jewish wedding was almost like a transaction in some ways. So the family of the bride and groom 
but mostly started with the groom, they would negotiate on a deal. Now, it's not like slavery. They're not paying for his wife. That, that's not what's going on here. But what is going on here is that the, the bride's family is losing a person of their household. So they're losing a breadwinner. They're losing a way of income. They're losing a way of like providing for the family. So the groom has to pay a dowry, which was decided that then like that was worth what they were losing, you know, with the bride leaving the household. Basically, once the bride or the groom was able to pay the family, the two could cohabitate and then they were married. Basically, the groom actually had to go and like make space. He actually had to like, in some cases, actually build a house, or in other cases, it was, you know, work his, you know, butt off to get this amount of money to go and do this. But there was actual intentionality there with making space for their future wives. Now, we actually don't know exactly where Joseph was on this kind of, you know, process, but we do know that he was ready to make space for Mary. Right? He's, he's engaged, they're ready, obviously they're, you know, they're, they're ready to do it. But the scripture tells us that Mary should have been publicly shamed for having a child out of marriage. Remember, the Levitical law reigned at this time, and Leviticus 20, verse 10 says, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, the wife of his neighbor, and the adulteress are to be put to death. Joseph knew that. The scripture tells us that Joseph was a righteous man. Now the word righteous in this text means is a person that is in good standings with God. They know the law, they follow the law, they're in proper relationship with him. So Joseph was absolutely fully aware of the law and the cultural standards stacking up against him and Mary. He is not breaking off their marriage to like run away from Mary and forget about all his problems over there. He's not doing that. What he's doing, Joseph is trying to fix the problem with his own understanding, with his own mind. He's saying, oh, uh, I'll try and make just like a little bit of space over here so that, you know, Mary doesn't have to like die and the child she's carrying doesn't have to die. Because he's still a righteous man. He still cares. Joseph was a descendant of David. That's a pretty big name to live up to. Joseph was a very good functioning member of society. He had a job, he had a family, he had status. People knew who he was. He had influence. Why would he give all that up for a wife and a child that isn't his and he has no idea where it came from? I'm going to be honest. If I was Joseph in this, in this situation, I would have done exactly what he did. I would do everything to make sure that it ends peacefully and that, you know, nobody dies or anything like that. But then I can run and I can still have my cushy life with my job and my, fan, my friends and my family. Because we're not ready to make space for that. We have the space allocated already, the space that we want, but we're not ready to change it. We're not ready to move something out of the way. To make space for something we care about, we move stuff around. When you set up your Christmas tree, you move your living room or whatever around because you care about the Christmas tree and you make sure that it has space. Let's, look a look, let's take a look at a story from, from my life, a personal story. So back in my second year of Bible college, about two years ago, right around this time, uh, at the beginning of the year, I had just finished working a very long and amazing summer working with the PAOC in Manitoba. 
So I worked with them as an intern, so I ran their generational camp. So kids, seniors, junior youth, youth, all of them. And it was, it's amazing, it's awesome, it, it has changed my life more than I can say in good ways. But it's so tiring because like it's your first taste at like what pastoral ministry really is because you're, 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 you're on 24 hours a day. You're with your kids. You literally sleep with them in the same cabin. There's, there's no off time. Like anybody that's been a camp counselor understands what I'm saying. Like there is no break. So I finished doing all that. I was done on like right around the 27th of August. The 28th, I had one I had one full 24-hour day to pack up my life, say goodbye to my family and friends, and then like get ready to move back six and a half hours to get ready for school. So the 27th I was done, 28th I packed, 29th was on the road. No time to rest, no time to recuperate. I was sick, it was bad, I should, it, it just wasn't the smartest decision in my life. So I came back to Saskatoon to start RA training. So RA is just short for resident assistant. So what that means is you're part of the team that is in charge of running the dorms. So you give people their rooms, room checks. We had to clean the bathrooms that year, which was like super like challenging in many ways, but it was also super rewarding because you got to see people uh, kind of grow as humans. But but again, you're on 24 hours a day. You have people knock on your door at 4 a.m. like, hey, this doesn't work, or I lost my key, or, or whatever. So it's like you, it's a very taxing position. Plus, I have observed, I can't, I can't say this verbatim, but I have observed that it seems to be the second year of Horizon is the most challenging. Because they kind of stop babying you from your first year where it's like, oh, you, you, you technically plagiarized here, but it's okay because you didn't know how. It's like second year, you're like, that's illegal. You got to change it. Like everything changes because like that's the real world. Like you, you're not babied through life like that. And it's a real reality check. And the workload jumps from like nice introductory courses to like, you know, like a little five and four down here to like freaking 300 on the workload scale. Like... Because, like, you're, you're not just learning about simple facts anymore. You're actually asked your opinion. You're like, huh, what, what do you actually believe and why do you believe it? So it, it's really groundbreaking in a lot of ways, but it's super challenging. On top of all that, as Pastor Ethan said, I had been working with youth and everything like that. So th where was the time for Jesus, right? You know, I had an insane workload. I had the RA position. I had youth and volunteering here. I had a personal life that I had to try to maintain, right? Like I have friends and different things like that and try to future plan for next summer and everything like that. So where was the time for Jesus? There wasn't. My life was just peachy, you could say. Sort of like Joseph in some ways, you know? I have all this, I have all this time and I'm ready to go, but when it comes to actually like taking time for Jesus and everything like that, it's not there. This took its toll on me so heavily. My grades crashed and burned. Like, I don't mean like I went from like a 70 to like a 60. I went from like full on like passing to just like, like just not non-existent almost. And the worst part of this was, is that My relationship with Jesus was zero to none. It basically didn't exist. There was a span of about two to three months where I think I honestly came to church, like, w without volunteering, like, twice. Now, that's not a brag. That, that I am so disappointed in myself that I did that. Because, like, that's the time you need Jesus the most. But that didn't happen. I got sick. Like, you know I said I got sick at the beginning of the summer? Or, like, at the end of the summer? I never recovered. Because you're just constantly busy and stressed, and there's no space to recover. There's no space for Jesus. 
I was angry all the time. It didn't matter what class I was in, I would argue. I'd argue back. I'd be like, no, that's wrong, that's wrong. Blah, 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 I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it this way. It was all about my way. There was no space for anything but mine. It, it was terrible. It got so bad that I managed to actually fail a class at a place that is designed to not let anyone fail. So Horizon, they have a very distinct, uh, distinct model for education. So when you do an assignment, and let's say you don't pass it all the way, they send it back to you and say, hey, you missed a couple of areas here, fix it, and you're good. So you're not meant to fail. I did. Because there was no space. There was, there was no space for me to, to recover and, to, and to, to check myself and to be with Jesus to make myself better. Life without space for Jesus is probably the most scariest time in my life ever. I never want back in that. I never want to visit that place in my life again where I go two, three months without going to church, without barely praying, without reading my Bible. I don't want to get there ever again. I thought I would just make space for Jesus when it worked for me. You know? Oh, I, I got 10 seconds here. Thanks, Jesus. Done. Or, oh, th I'll read that Bible scripture in class. There we go. I'm good for the month. He was just another add-on to my already crazy, busy life. I was like Joseph. I knew I loved Jesus, just like he knew he loved Mary. He was 100% ready and all in to marry her, but when it came down to changing it and making space and giving up something that he knew, he wasn't ready. I was not willing to give up space in my life for Jesus. Joseph wasn't ready either. It wasn't until, you know, like Joseph had a crucial conversation with God, or an angel, and I had a crucial conversation with God and somebody else that I realized that I need space for Jesus. So fast forward through this year, and <laughs> by the grace of God, I'm, I'm, I'm here and I'm going to hopefully graduate, so some, I guess I did something right. But I go back and I work with the PAOC again. It was fantastic. And, and I, I technically signed on to BRA, and I called Heather, our assistant dean of students, and I was like, hey, Heather, you know, like, I, I'm kind of ready to do this, but I think I only want to do it, like, part-time, because it's a full-time position. And she's like, nope. And, like, the nicest way possible, she's like, nope. And I was like, and then, and then I was like, oh, why not? And she's like, well, this, this, and this, and she, you know, told me, you know, you need to make space for Jesus and all this stuff. And then I was like, yeah, but I can do it. Like, I can make space. She's like, no, you can't. Nope. And then I was like, what if I only do it like one day a week? She's like, nope. And I kept trying to kept trying to do this and do this and do this. She's like, no, 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 no. And then my stubborn self finally, after like half an hour of trying to negotiate on something, she was kind of like, Logan, I release you from this position. Stop worrying about it. And that was that. And I didn't do it. And I took a whole last year to refocus my life and focus on Jesus. I made space for him. So church, please hear me. Make space for Jesus. We need to make space for Jesus even when it's not Christmas. We, Jesus is important 24 hours a day, not just on his birthday on December 25th. A life without Jesus is dark, sad, scary, lonely, and pretty much any other you know, dark and gloomy adjective you want to put on it. Look at Joseph. His life was crashing around him. His soon-to-be wife is somehow pregnant with a child that he doesn't know where it came from. He doesn't know if Mary was raped or cheated or any other terrible thing that happened. He has no idea. He just knows that the person he loved will, could possibly be put to death. But he still, in the end, makes space for Mary. You know what still baffles me the most about Christmas, though, that I, and I still don't have an answer for this, is that we forget that Christmas is the day the world changed forever. 
how is it that the world today makes such a big deal about birthdays? I know people that will take their whole day off of work to celebrate. Or I know, I, I have heard of friends back home who don't celebrate their birthday, they celebrate their birth month. So every weekend is a different type of celebration, whether one's a party, a movie, or whatever. Why isn't there that for Jesus on his birthday? He changed history. Yet we still give each other gifts on someone else's birthday. No, I'm not perfect. I fall victim to the same trap that we all do. I like presents just like the next guy. But that isn't the focus of Christmas. We need to remember to make space this Christmas season for Jesus. We actually need to go, and we need to move, and we need to like take something out of our life, throw it away, and then actually have space for Jesus. There is no adding him on when you have five seconds. That, that, that doesn't work. Jesus doesn't want a part of us. He wants all of us. I don't know how making space looks for each and every one of you here. I know for myself, I pray every day. Now, do I take an hour and, and, and pray every day? Some days, absolutely. But most of the times, it, it's 10 minutes in the morning and it's 10 minutes at night. And that satisfies my space and my time with Jesus. On top of, you know, like, reading my Bible and everything like that, but I do that. So I got, so I used to have an iPhone, and when you have an iPhone, it, they introduced this, like, screen time recording, like, built-in feature. So every week, it used to tell me how much time I spent on my phone. And boy, was I surprised the first time I got that notification, and it said, Logan, you spent an average of, like, nine hours a day on your phone. Or, sorry, a week, a week. <laughs> Not a day. That's insane. No. <laughs> but that's still an entire work day of my life wasted on my phone. W why did I spend that time with Jesus? It's so easy, though. I, like, I understand it. It's so easy for us to sit there and scroll Facebook and, and look at Baby Yoda memes or do whatever we want to look at, watch Netflix. Like, I get it. It's so easy to do that. But I have to let that time go. I've moved that out of my life. Now I spend an average of about two hours of time on my phone a week. That's six hours now where I can use that extra time to spend with Jesus, to do my homework, to get me closer to Jesus, to do all of these things. To make space for Jesus, something has to go. There are only 24 hours a day. We, we can't do everything in a day, but we need to make space for Jesus every day. One thing that I did when I was in Bible college, and I don't remember who taught it to me, but it was something that also really, you know, shook me, was somebody said, Logan, write 1 to 24 on a piece of paper and write down exactly what you're doing every hour for a day. Again, boy, was I really surprised when I found out how much time I wasted. Maybe for you guys here to make space for Jesus, maybe it's going to the Christmas Eve service. Doesn't have to be here. We would like it for you to be here. But maybe it's going here. And maybe that's, maybe you come to Christmas Eve and you leave the family board game night to another night. Or maybe it's, uh, I'm going to read a devotion with my family before we open presents. Pastor John told this story last week and I thought it was so cool. He told this story about how a family will wake up every Christmas morning 
And on the table is a cake that says, Happy Birthday, Jesus. They celebrate Jesus' birthday. When we make space for Jesus, life is good. If you look further into Joseph and Mary and, and Jesus' life, you see that God provided for them. Once Joseph, you know, the angel of the Lord spoke to him, and he did it, and he, and he, mar- he finished the marriage with Mary, and, and he goes off, and he literally gives up everything. They run away, be, you know, to Egypt, and then they, they raise Jesus and everything like that. It was good for them. They weren't treated like royalty necessarily, but God gave them everything they needed. Please, make space for Jesus by getting rid of something else. So answer this question, how do we make space for Jesus in the busyness of life? Shorter answer is, don't be so busy. But that obviously doesn't help us. To make space for Jesus, something's got to go. I don't know what that is for you. I know what it was for me. Please, church. We need to make space for Jesus. Like I said, he doesn't want to be an add-on. He's not some, you know, extra battery you buy for something. He's, he's there. He wants all of us.